Diane, Diane Hamilton, welcome. Uh, welcome to Radio Wolf. I'm very pleased uh, to be able to talk to you again. Diane Musho Hamilton, to be precise, uh, you are a longtime meditator, uh, you're an author, mediator, teacher of Zen. <laughs> you worked a long time for conflict resolution. And uh, you wrote something on your website that I would like to ask you afterwards. You wrote mediate and meditate share the same purpose. I would like, mm -hmm. like to come back to that. You also wrote a couple of books. Books, one is everything is workable, a same approach to conflict resolution. One is how to speak and listen from the heart. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. today I want to talk with you about a topic that seems uh, something that you are working on. Mm -hmm. It is about emotional maturity, which I think um, for all of us is just an important topic. And you can look at it from a personal perspective of personal maturity, but also when we talk about our so social environment, uh, emotional maturity are, plays also in our social sphere mm -hmm. a more and more important role. So to start with, what what made you focus on this topic? Hmm. Well, you and I are both involved in what Ken Wilber refers to as waking up and growing up. And the waking up is through the through meditative and spiritual discipline, basically learning to learning to perceive and identify the part of ourselves that is beyond our personal individualized identity that is really um, somehow completely coherent with the rest of reality and inseparable, you might say. I mean, I know these words in the abstract sound kind of a little bit pretentious, but that, you know, to really come into through meditative discipline and, and spiritual work to really see ourselves as part of all that is and have that level of relaxation and confidence in our life and our, and our, um, the privilege of being here. That's the waking up project. But we find that the waking up project, we could say, you know, we could, it could be called a recognition of the absolute, um, in our, but we also live in the relative. We live in the, the domain of two. So if, you know, if realization is recognizing the domain of one, we have to enact that in the domain of two, which is you and me and mm -hmm. one another. And so we have to also be skilled and that in that domain. And that's what Ken refers to as growing up. And what growing up really implies is that we are as individuals and as a collective becoming more and more um, aware of the complexity of our mind and the difficulty of relationship. And that one of the dimensions that makes relationship difficult is the presence of our emotions. And, you know, you can think about the stereotype of Dr. Spock in Star Trek, who somehow was a supremely rational person and was never affected by the emotional domain. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not an ideal. What is meant by emotional maturity and emotional development is an ability to really recognize our the emotional dimension of our experience, our deeply held emotional patterns for better and for worse, and to learn how to feel properly. And we're not really taught how to feel. We're not really taught what to do with our feelings. You know, we we tend to either we tend to absorb a lot from our families and our culture around how to feel. Some of us come from highly feeling environments in which when emotions arise, they take over the day. And sometimes we can dwell in them and not be able to, to really experience them in a, in a healthy way because they, we get swamped. And on the other hand, some of us are very used to living in environments in which we don't feel much at all and feeling doesn't seem to enter into it. And there can be a quality of woodenness or um, an inability to be moved or even to connect because one of the mm -hmm. most powerful parts of emotion is that we feel each other so immediately and so directly we connect really emotionally so profoundly so it's important for us as individuals and as groups to learn how to include 
feeling and how to let go of feeling. Mm. And there's a lot of good work being done out there. I think Daniel Goleman's em- Emotional Maturity is was really maybe one of the first books to really start to outline how we could start to work with our emotions. And for myself, I think it was in my my Buddhist training um, when I went to was trained at Naropa Institute that I first came into contact with this idea that mind training included working with feeling. You said something that really surprised me. And I would like to hear more about, you talked about feeling properly. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. So because feeling, the feeling domain of our experience, and now I, I use a spectrum, and this is a spectrum I created. I don't know. I haven't seen it particularly spelled out this way, but other people have different spectrums. So I call a sensation any experience in the body that doesn't really have an emotional name attached to it. So I could feel a clenching in my solar plexus or heat in my face, or I could feel tremulousness in my limbs, but I don't say I'm anxious or I'm uptight. I haven't given it a name. Mm -hmm. As soon as I give it a name, so cognition and the sensation come together, I call that a feeling. So if I say I'm worried, for mm-hmm. example, but I'm not really describing the sensation, but I'm giving, I'm giving the sensation a label. I call that a feeling. An emotion is really the feedback loop between our minds and our bodies. So for example, I have an interaction with my spouse that creates tension. That interaction, I have thought about it. I'm playing it over in my mind. All of a sudden, I notice my stomach's churning a little bit. Um, Uh, And then my mind starts to think, well, I wish we wouldn't do that. Why do we do that? And then all of a sudden my heart rate increases. So this interaction between cognition and body that that literally can be sustained for days Mm -hmm. is an emotion. When an emotion is sustained in that way, it becomes a mood. Mm -hmm. And when a mood is sustained over time, it becomes a trait, becomes an attribute. Mm -hmm. Now, we talk in mind training about states becoming traits. And generally, what is implied is positive states like loving kindness or compassion or sympathetic joy, equanimity. Those can become entrained to become traits. But the reverse is also the case. Our worry, our anger, our doubt our confusion can also become traits and we hear ourselves say things like he's an angry person she's a sad person so there's this spectrum from sensation all the way to a characteristic and what feeling properly means is to locate feeling and emotion and to learn to work with it in a way that acknowledges the intelligence and the energy of the emotion but you don't get trapped in it it's Mm -hmm. able to be liberated like a child experiences emotion comes Mm -hmm. up, flowers, blooms, and is let go of. That's -hmm. what it means to feel properly. We let ourselves be moved. We let ourselves understand what the information is, but we don't use our cognition to stay entrapped. So Mm -hmm. there's a skill that right between feeling and emotion that we can cultivate. We call that the transmutation of emotion. that's, 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 That's very interesting. If I understand you right, what you're saying, the difference between an emotion and a feeling is, um, consciousness that yes there is something there's a feedback loop happening between circumstances and bodily reactions and kind of mm-hmm. uh, my psychology which is kind of an outdoor uh, at least half outdoor response that i do have mm-hmm. uh, which so i hear you is my emotional response to whatever and then there is a capacity to be aware of what this is to be able to name it yeah yeah Uh, we can actually witness it yeah and name it Mm -hmm. uh, which makes a lot of sense that i as soon as you put the light of consciousness to an emotion Mm -hmm. uh, that you're in a a very different situation because uh, you uh, uh, i wear what this heart rate that I'm ex- experiencing, what it means in my meaning field, in my in my field of what makes is meaningful, 
in whatever sense in my in in, in my life, and that allows us in, uh, to have an emotional relationship to, uh, an, an sorry, a conscious relationship to my emotional response. Precisely, and that's what Ken means when he talks about growing up, is that we because of the light of awareness and the ability to be conscious of literally what's happening in our physiology and in our cognition that we can become, we can develop, we can emotionally mature. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the idea. Mm -hmm. So one part of this emotional maturity is simply to start or be in the process of uh, being more conscious of oneself, particular also my emotional reality mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just see that there's a lot there that uh, I'm not fully aware of that it is there. And yeah. It makes sense to learn a little more about who I am and, and how I respond to reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to understand that our emotional responses are natural. They're part of a very ancient set, uh, an ancient intelligence. Um, you know, it's the limbic system in the brain. It's uh, highly correlated to human bonding and to the impact that humans have on one another. You don't see emotion at the same in the same way in reptiles that you see in mammals who give birth to live young. And there's this whole display of information that comes to us very directly prior to cognition. And animals are very emotional creatures in the same way, but they move through emotion quite quickly in the same way that babies do. So a lot can be learned from how they shake off the experience of fear, how quickly anger subsides in an animal. It comes in very, very immediately. And that's true of us too. But if I could just give one more frame that I think can sometimes be helpful, and I wish I could credit the person who I learned this from, but I learned it in a workshop many years ago, and I don't remember who it was. But when they study culture, there are two dimensions in communication that they pay attention to. One is whether communication is explicit or implicit and whether emotion is expressed or not expressed. And so, for example, much of American culture is direct or explicit communication mm -hmm. and expressed emotion. Where in German culture, and you tell me whether you think this is true, German culture is very direct in terms of uh, communicating meaning, but inexpressive emotionally. There's less expression directly of emotion. Where, for example, in some Arab cultures, there's a lot of expressiveness with emotion, but communication is implicit. Mm -hmm. It's not explicit. And then, for example, in Japanese culture, which through my Zen study, it tends to be communications are implicit. There's a lot of subtlety that you have to be aware of and also inexpressive. So um, it's not that emotion isn't there. It's just not expressed as directly. And so it's it's this also really influences how it is that we understand and relate with emotion is mm -hmm. our families and also our culture. Which also means, uh, and I'm curious if, if you see it that way, that emotional maturity means also to be aware of my environment and my culture. Mm -hmm. Let's say in a Japanese culture, which is known to be, let's say, very indirect in the expression of mm -hmm. emotions. Yes. Uh, to honor the environment you are in, uh, mm -hmm. you would not respond in an American way. Precisely. Yes, exactly. And that, and the fact that you could even have that choice mm -hmm. would be an example of having more development that you could actually choose. You know, it's an interesting thing that's happening in, in the press right now with the release of Prince Harry's book, mm -hmm. because in a way what you're seeing is this incredible expression of emotion and this disclosure that is really not congruent, particularly with old style England and the Royal family and the, the school of manners and the way the queen comported herself. So you see this just complete, complete conflict around disclosing and expressing emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, a, it's just creating this incredible conflict. Because when you introduce it this way, there is also a different dimension coming up because the first dimension that you're addressing has a lot to do with authenticity and conscious yes. authenticity. Correct. Mm -hmm. This dimension, uh, is an awareness of context and others. 
that are, is a different domain. I can be very aware why I'm angry, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't really care what it means for you. Mm -hmm. But there's a different dimension caring about, for example, a relationship. It can be a mm -hmm. cultural relationship in the big or just a personal relationship. In caring for, for this relationship, uh, my relationship to my emotions, but also to my feeling changes because maybe mm -hmm. I am angry. Maybe I'm even angry for a, whatever rightful reasons. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's something where honoring the relationship, I respond differently than just expressing my anger. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on the one hand, you're talking about authenticity as being in deep relationship to oneself and honoring one's own experience and one's impulses. But when we're in relationship, there's all there's a whole set of other considerations, including the conditioning and the norms of the other and how they experience and express emotion. Mm -hmm. So, for example, to pick up what you're talking about, Lots of times when I'm working with conflict and I'm working in a group, I will take a read on how many people in the room are comfortable with direct emotion. How many people can tolerate a certain amount of expressiveness in the room and a kind of intensity and how many people actually can and find that they freeze in relationship to that. And then I'll ask people to kind of dial it in to where the norms are in a group. Or sometimes I'll split up a group so that people can practice their conflict resolution skills with a group of people who have similar conditioning around how emotion is expressed. Because for people who aren't used to it, it's incredibly overwhelming coming into the system. And for people, for people who aren't used to it, and for people who are, if you don't express there, where are you? You know, where I, I need the feeling to know that I'm in relationship. So the adaptability that you're describing is another feature of, of a mature relationship to one's emotions. Mm. I mean, w one way to describe the difference, uh, for example, for the Japanese and the American culture, mm -hmm. is also that the Japanese culture is very contextual. Yes. Yeah, I think all cultures are, but yes, there's a formalism and there's a, a sense of the, there's a tremendous emphasis on the quality of the collective and what happens in the collective. So the individual is not privileged at all. It's the, yeah. how do we take care of this collective space, you could say. I mean, that that's uh, uh, exactly uh, uh, where I wanted to go because the, the American culture, of course, is very individuated, very individual. Yes. I mean, it goes so deep in the, in the Japanese culture, which I find fascinating that mm -hmm. the Japanese don't have a single word for the word I. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's dependent on who I'm talking to you, how I name this I, if it's an elder, younger, female or male. Mm -hmm. so, so the sense of myself is not an independent sense. It's, yeah. as, it's, as, it's completely uh, uh, created by the context that I'm in. Yeah. And in a way, it's a recognition of how how fluid self-identity is and how much who we are is created by context in the sense that I can be with my friends and feel very autonomous. And if I go home to my family, suddenly all that freedom I experienced the night before is gone and I'm reacting in all kinds of ways that I didn't expect. So we are co-created, you know, we're co-created by our environment and our relationships. Where I would like to go with this, because it seems to me that there are two forms of emotional immaturity. Uh, one is uh, basically to just be overwhelmed by the context I'm in, my family, my tribe, and just mm -hmm. basically uh, be contextualized by that in a, in, in a very childish way. I'm, I'm just right. part of this family system and mm -hmm. I don't question it and I don't, there is no me in that. You, you, right. you ask this very American question, where are you? Uh, this mm -hmm. question is not asked. Yeah. In the, in, yeah. in the, so there is an emotional uh, uh, immaturity of being lost uh, in, in, in this relation, re, relation field. Mm -hmm. And there's another form of Im emotional uh, immaturity, which seems to be very much more the case in our postmodern narcissistic time. Yeah. Where basically I'm only aware of myself. Yes, that's right. That's where right. I, the way you show up is only what it means for me uh, mm -hmm. in, in my kind of self-centered way of seeing the, the world you you mm -hmm. 
you play a certain role, but the gravity field is completely centered on myself and my perception mm -hmm. of reality. Mm -hmm. And I'm emotionally not able to transcend that. Mm -hmm. So these are very, very different forms of immaturity. Yes. Yeah. And whether it's the narcissistic trend or whether it's the codependent, you know, to use those psychological terms, the place that I always like to start when I'm working with people on emotion is before we get to the relational or the unrelational, non-relational field to really talk about the experience of the sensation in the body. Because where most people struggle in terms of being able to evolve is they have difficulty inhabiting the sensations themselves. So we do have to start with the individual because mm -hmm. um, some people are so, so what word can I use that they're so disidentified with the body that they really don't even know that they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So to tune into their body and start to notice, oh, you know, I feel that, you know, I feel some sort of a, something intolerable, you know, in my solar plexus or the pain that I'm experiencing in my neck or uh, like I talked about before, just the sensation of adrenaline in my limbs is intolerable. Mm -hmm. I, I literally have a hard time feeling it. So for someone who has so differentiated from feeling that they can't experience the sensations, they really do need to turn inward and they need to learn how to use the breath to calibrate the intensity because breath will help us tolerate the experience of feeling. And even if someone like me who has a lot of practice with this, I went through last year, some big experiences. Well, it's 2021. Uh, my mother died of COVID. My nephew overdosed. As you know, my good friend per Terry Patton died. So I had this, just this sorrow mm -hmm. and grief set in upon me. And I would notice my unwillingness to feel. Mm -hmm. And I would deliberately give myself the instruction to surrender to the feeling and to and then with grief there's always this sense it's a very watery and you literally feel you're going to drown if you let yourself feel you're going to drown and then you one learns to surrender to that and to let your body cry and then inevitably you just kind of float back up to the surface mm -hmm. you just float up to the surface and in that moment there's this opportunity to extend to others and to really feel compassion for others who are also grieving right now. And that's, that's a Buddhist instruction. So we do have to start with the individual in order to mature, mm -hmm. but then letting go and tuning into others, those two have to absolutely be in relationship. Otherwise mm -hmm. we're narcissistic or we're codependent. It's How do we become freely functioning? It's interesting that you're saying this way, because I tend to, to agree and to disagree at the same time. Okay, good. Let's, and, let's uh, explore both. And I, I am curious how you respond to that. Because what you're describing, uh, I just know very well also about myself, also being kind of an intellectual uh, white male uh, in, the, in the individual, German on top of everything, uh, kind of to really be able to feel I, I, in an embodied way, uh, uh, took a lot of effort, let's put it that way. To, the cut it mm -hmm. short and and that's uh, i think big part also of the journey of of our generation i, I think the whole the therapy yeah. movement the, the body therapy movement uh, breath work and all their, their responses to that and uh, it's very powerful very beautiful and, and, and very important out of all the reasons that you were giving mm -hmm. but right. it is I, can, I, can, I know where you're going and, and you're right. Your disagreement is also true because it picks up the other side, yeah. which is a tendency to dwell in the trauma and a, a tendency to treat all of our triggers as though they're the only thing. That, it's like feeling becomes the thing. So what you're pointing to is that then we get over identified with feeling and we don't release it enough. Yeah. Because is this that is fair. Yeah, you know, because this is something I more and more tend to experience, particularly with the younger generation yeah mm -hmm. who that's my interpretation of it yeah. are have boomer parents are got a lot of this emotional draining and emo and self are uh, uh, focused uh, emotional uh, 
-hmm. upbringing. And uh, I just see, and maybe me, uh, uh, that there is a lostness in any kind of particular pain response, uh, mm -hmm. or response, uh, fear response, uh, uh, and, 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 and the in incapacity to hold something against these responses of my body or embodiment. Yeah, body for feet. sure. Absolutely. So, so you're really, when you say I agree and I don't, well, yes, because some of us are too differentiated from the body, not feeling, and we're really trying to get in touch with that because it, it creates division when we don't feel. And on the other hand, there are those of us that once we've opened that up, or once we've you know, that where we just, we don't have any way to moderate our feeling. And we demand that other people address our feelings at every turn. And we, you know, you and I are both in, in uh, roles right now where we teach or we lead, and there's a big demand put on me as a leader to, to feel with everybody. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to say, no, we're not feeling right now. You can feel, but we're moving on. You know, I'll, we'll give space to feeling. And how long do, do we feel? So that's the whole point is a, a mature emotional body is one that cognition and consciousness, as you said before, affects. And we can make decisions around the skillfulness of it, when to feel, how much to feel, whether to empathize, when to withhold, when to overcome our feeling. I mean, you could never do any kind of training if you weren't willing to overcome your impulse to towards wanting comfort so our mind training our spiritual training we've had to overcome our feelings a ton there are lots of mornings when i'm in a session i don't want to get out of bed i feel tired i feel fatigued well what happens is i look ahead i think about what it is i'm there for and i get up mm -hmm. So the point that you're making is totally it's almost like as you said you're in this generation where your parents because of the trauma of the war and also just the you know the lack of feeling you could say sophistication didn't feel and now the younger people you're working with you could say overfeel mm -hmm. is that fair no very, that reflects very much my experience and <clears throat> it's also interesting how uh, uh, how one has to navigate uh, the whole field of emotions. Basically, there's not this one answer. The, it, it goes on all sides all the time. So, so the question is also, in this navigating of feelings and emotions, what is the North Star? Uh, do you have something uh, that allows you to navigate it? Because when you say uh, uh, this is, you, you, you don't feel yourself enough, or when you say uh, it's overfeeling, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what do you relate this to to be to, to to be able to say that? Well, now and keep in mind, I want I want your listening audience to understand this that I you know my work is applied in the domain of communication and conflict mm -hmm. resolution, and so feeling is a really important thing in there. And my, and the North Star that I'm always attending to is it engendering life force. Or is it depleting life force? Mm -hmm. Is it turning the mind towards a positive outcome? Or is it creating negativity? So how enlivened a, an individual or a group is by the expression of emotion? Mm -hmm. And when the group starts to freeze or clench or get depressed or too angry so that people can't learn, because one of the things we know about the brain is that you know, a lot of context in the U.S., again, as a facilitator, people will say to me, you can't police feeling if people are angry. And my response to that is, I'm happy for people to express their anger and their self-righteousness. There's a truth in it and there's room for that. But if it's done in such a way that other people feel a need to defend, they've stopped learning. You can't learn when your fight or flight system is online. You just mm -hmm. can't. So if you're yelling at people in a way that everybody is feeling that they've got to defend themselves and they're looking for an exit, that's not going to fly in my work. Mm -hmm. You've got to bring it into a range that people can open and hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. And I just take strong stands for that. Yeah. It's a different environment in Europe than it is in the States. It's kind of dicey here now, right now. Yeah. Uh, 
different but uh, not unrelated let's put it this way okay um, and i i really like uh, how you put the north star how it's i think you said life supporting mm -hmm. and there's something uh, from my own experience with dialogical work that i find very interesting mm -hmm. that uh, being in a situation in whatever kind of uh, dialogical group situation there is something uh, that I find every single time uh, very powerful and amazing. Mm -hmm. This to the sense that I'm able to be with the dialogical whole mm -hmm. uh, and even have, if I may say it this way, a love relationship with that. Mm -hmm. There's something coming in that allows me to be more mature than I would be otherwise. Because there's something where I feel I really, uh, but out of love of what is happening in the, in the whole, mm -hmm. I'm able to, to find a different response in myself, not in not by suppressing my, uh, mm -hmm. but by having a, a, a kind of a strong relationship to, to this wholeness that I am aware of and that I'm in love in, mm -hmm. that holds my, that changes the economy of my emotions. Let's put it that way. Yeah, fair, fair, yeah. And yeah. is this something also that is in, in uh, uh, cultivating a, a emotional maturity, kind of a widening context and uh, being able to be in relationship with others for real in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a way that I am aware also what this entails, mm -hmm. uh, that all of a sudden, uh, uh, things turn around in this way because usually one says one needs to be emotionally mature in order to be in that context but uh, all of a sudden is that this context supports yeah. me yeah in being emotionally yeah. mature yeah yeah that seems that seems very right um ken often makes the comment that the culture and the groups of people will either bring us down in terms of our maturity or lift us up. The context is very powerful in that way. I think probably one of the differences between your experience and mine is that I tend to work in situations where there's conflict. So we're mm -hmm. always starting out divided. Mm -hmm. So in a certain way, I have to encourage groups to, if you will, see the love and the conflict. And that the body is not giving us the sensation that it's love they're giving us the sensation that it's threat mm -hmm. and so i have to encourage groups to to just be present and let's let the energy move and change so we work with that division and then eventually it liberates and and then we're able to have the sensation that you're talking about um, but it requires a certain amount of being present to what is unpleasant in the body in order to have the experience that you're describing. And it's really quite amazing because it will, with the right quality of attention and the right sort of affirming of perspectives and the sense that there's there's something right in each perspective. You know, we say in integral that every perspective is true and partial. And so within a conflict, if we can really explore how this perspective is true, it's giving rise to certain feelings. And then the other side is also true, and that's giving rise to certain feelings. And then how they share that with one another. And then there's a liberation where people can experience love, the sensation of love in the body, as opposed to the sensation of threat. There's also something I would like to bring back that you mentioned in the very beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And you talked about Ken's a distinction between growing up and waking up mm -hmm. and uh, the spiritual realm and the realm of our social relationship. And my question is, aren't those two also very related? Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean it in that way. And you can put it in different contexts, depending on what kind of spiritual practice you are involved in. Sure. That, uh, Let's say if it's a more theistic spiritual practice that your relationship to the divine, to God, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's a heartfelt relationship, mm -hmm. and that's 
particular Jew in Christian mysticism or in Sufi mysticism, uh, allows you to be there in your social context in a different way because your allegiance is to something. If it's not kind of a, doc it can be also an allegiance to some dogmatic idea of something, but it's not, it's not what I'm pointing to. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of this um, absolute uh, mm -hmm. love force for the emergence of life itself, which mm -hmm. I would <laughs> call a different mm -hmm. definition of what this God impulse may be about. But if it's in a non-theistic context, it's the same. It's the, it's the liberation of attachment. And, uh, the, the the openness of the emergence or emptiness, mm -hmm. Tao, in whatever yeah, way yeah. you uh, mm -hmm. describe uh, the non-theistic perspective yes. on, the, on, mm -hmm. the, on the spiritual awakening up. Right. Isn't that that my kind of um, living relationship with this dimension allows me uh, mm -hmm. not only, that's the, that's the shadow side of it, to kind of mm -hmm. avoid all my emotional <laughs> realities and kind of do a spiritual bypassing number on it. Uh, if I don't do that, it allows me to develop a maturity to confront myself with everything that's happening. Yeah, that's right. Well, when you say, aren't they related? One of the, the points that Ken's, Ken makes is that the more developed someone is along a particular line of intelligence. So let's take a, an athlete like, uh, you know, just these really high performing athletes. Michael Jordan comes to mind because he's my generation basketball player. You know, when he's at his height, he is functioning in a, in a non-dual place. He may not conceive of it that way, but actually the more developed you are kinesthetically, the more the non-dual experience is available to you. The same is true if you're a chef. If you're a chef and you're so developed, you literally are, you literally are experiencing the entire meal at the moment that you're making any choice. There's no, the, the sense of the wholeness of the experience, and it, it could include the dining and the way things are served. It's all one thing. It isn't, you know, there's a discrete moment of making a choice to, you know, use cilantro or something to to bring out this but there's an incredible oneness to the whole experience and that's true of this as well so the point that you're making that growing up and waking up at higher levels of inter you know interpersonal relational development is also a spiritual experience and that in fact the waking up informs the growing up it's no longer a dualistic em enterprise it's rather that all of a sudden i'm experiencing what is happening here as beyond who I am, in which I'm expressing the particular, but I am so utterly the whole at the same time. And I think for the work that you do, that that's, that's a genuine reality. You know, you've been doing it for so long and you're so good at it, that how could it not be, how could it really be so dualistic? Because when we talk about growing up, it's a dualistic enterprise. Um, unless one becomes very aware of the ways in which we're not separate. Mm. I also would like to go a little in the social domain of our times. And I find um, what you call emotional maturity also so important because I think, let's put it that way, I find it a, a tremendously uh, important political feature for our time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And part of why I think it is so, because whatever this transition time is that we're in, uh, there's some, something like a civilizational breakdown hmm, yeah, uh, right. that we're experiencing. And right. there's a, a tremendous amount of uncertainty about everything. Mm -hmm. So, if basically my my coordinate system is breaking down, or our mm -hmm. even more so, our collective coordinate system is breaking down, and we yeah. don't know how to create a new one or integrate a new one or whatever, right? What I'm left with mm -hmm. are my emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they don't care about kind of my meaning system, how how this is kind of. Uh, in the modernist progress, more dem democracy environment, or if this is kind of identity, identity building nation or Christ Christian contextualization, mm -hmm. all that, 
all these kind of forms of individual and collective certainties mm -hmm. are emotional stabilizers. Yeah, they absolutely are. Absolutely, without a doubt. Anxiety. We see anxiety really going up, and particularly in young people right now. And I think it, it it's largely due to what you're describing. Yes, and what we are experiencing right now is kind of a, a what breaks open mm -hmm. when we don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a time of uh, unusual uncertainty, even more than uh, life is uncertain anyway, but there's the, the, there's a, there's, yeah. there's a, a strong collective experience of collective uncertainty. Oh. You can be on both uh, whatever side of the aisle, uh, it, this feeling is the same, mm -hmm. un unless you're sure about your, your thing. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in that, but deeply, even, even in that, the, this anger uh, connected certainties is based also quite often on a deep not knowing and insecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in that, isn't isn't in, in time like this what what you are promoting here as emotional uh, maturity also something that is something like a a, a, a civil uh, necessity for, for for our civil society to, to 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 find our way through this crisis situation that we are in. It, it, it's it, it's more than just my. I have I have to wake up. I have to be a mature person. I have to da da da. In a spiritual context, it's, it's it's we are talking also how we live together in our societies. That this is mm -hmm. something that is uh, tremendously important ingredients right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I tend to subscribe. I've talked quite a bit about Ken in our conversation because he's, Ken Wilber has been such a huge influence on how I practice and how I think. And I do believe that consciousness itself is evolving. Mm -hmm. I subscribe to that idea that even though in the domain of being, all things are equal, that in the, in the domain of the disclosures of consciousness, the truths, if you will, the, um, you know, the way in which we articulate it and, and explore our meaning, our meaning making system that that is changing. And for whatever reason, we are, we seem to be wanting to learn more about how to feel like that's emergent in psychology and in consciousness work in the same way that trauma work is emergent, you know, and that, you know, there just seems to be this built in kind of property to consciousness that is moving towards higher integration and more functionality. And for human beings, I, I mean, it's both right now. Some of the people in my life are just, they're, they're models for me of what's possible in terms of how to work with fear, how to work with the truth of anger without injuring others, how to to feel the preciousness of, of life and the, you know, and the beauty in a way that your heart is genuinely moved. Like I can feel so much from those people at the same time, you know, we have people in the Congress last week, you know, about coming to blows over, you know, who's going to be the speaker in kind of really crass and backward ways. It's like appalling in a certain mm -hmm. way to see that, you know, I know there's always political theater, mm -hmm. but this is kind of beyond that. It's expressing more of what you're talking about. So so for some reason, this co-emergence of the breakdown of certain things and the emergence of other things and trusting in some way that life itself has an agenda that I've lived enough to know that when I turn towards um, learning the things that the spiritual schools offer, my life is much more enhanced. Mm -hmm. I feel more brave. I feel more able to make peace with things like uncertainty and those kinds of things like my life is is considerably better than when i turn away from the wisdom traditions they are extremely helpful to me and i consider this to be a part of a wisdom style practice mm -hmm. and you were saying to me the other day on the phone and it was really helpful to me or on the you were you and i were talking in zoom that this idea of the emergence of a wisdom culture mm -hmm. well one part of that has to be how we collectively work with feeling mm -hmm. because we don't want to not feel nobody wants to not be moved by life, but we have to learn how to feel in ways that are skillful. 
you said before, uh, and I really made, it really made me curious that you have some people who really exemplify for you uh, a way how to deal with, I think you said fear and other emotions mm -hmm. uh, without kind of exposing those people. Uh, uh, I'm just curious, what is it that makes them uh, 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 exemplifying this virtues? What do they do? What is it? Well, I think that, the, that there's a recognition of the feeling. There's a willingness to, so let's imagine somebody being afraid of the, you know, the collapse of society, you know, and let's take Terry, for instance. Mm -hmm. Terry was very good at acknowledging that he was afraid and he turned towards the, and it went deeper into the experience. And then that fear had an opportunity. I and mean, because he made such a deep relationship to what our, you know, our environmental pressures really are, there was a quality of courage that emerged out of that fear, you know, where he was willing to talk about it and confront it directly. He's also a person who just knows how to laugh. I mean, I've never known anybody to laugh as fully as Terry laughed. You know, he laughed from his toes through his, you know, <laughs> seventh chakra. You know, it was just full body. And when he felt pain, he would feel it. And uh, so I, so it was something around his identification with the feeling, his disclosure of the feeling, and then his willingness to allow it to transmute. I really enjoyed learning from Terry about that. He was a very feeling man, you know. And sometimes I didn't like his feelings and I'd give him an elbow. <laughs> Say, hey, enough of your feeling. <laughs> I remember we were in a car together one time. We'd been on a long camping trip. And over the course of this trip, he kept telling me how much he wanted to experience more depth and something deeper from me. And when we got in the car on the way home, he said the same thing. You know, he wanted to feel more depth. And I said, if you don't shut up with that more depth thing, <laughs> you know, I'm done being deep for you, dude. Be shallow with me, will you? <laughs> so I think... Uh... There is a good example for that. So thank you so much to bring him in into this conversation. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, your work on emotional maturity. It's very inspiring. And thank, thank you for being interested. And I, I do want to say, because I want other people to hear this, that uh, I just really appreciate our friendship. Thank you so much. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much.